I think it's really interesting if you just compare my coverage of the Christian Porter, who was then unnamed, rape allegation, like PVOs or anyone else. I think when you see it, women tend to maybe take a more evidence-based approach. And the data has changed a lot in the last 20 years. We now have a lot more data about why women don't speak up, how long it takes for them to come to terms with what's happened to them. Whereas a lot of the men are just going, well, let's hear the other side. But the women, I feel, are coming in and saying, okay, here's this report, here's this report, here are the da- here's the data around how many, you know, sexual assault allegations that go to the end up going to the police and then end up getting prosecuted. It's a absolutely minuscule amount. So while I think women have really been leading the charge on this, there are a lot of men that are happy to give their two cents too, um, and perhaps incorrectly so. And, and yes, men need to be educated on these things as well, but perhaps hadn't done the research they needed to, to be able to comment on it. Oh, God, yeah. So, you know, re- reputation is very closely connected to um, privilege. What has shifted this year quite fundamentally, although we won't really see its impacts for some time to come, is is that power balance between men and women in power, in the circles of power, and and parliament is, is sort of the focal point of that. The men are scared and and feel the threat of loss of privilege that that men have always enjoyed. And so one of the ways they're responding to that quite instinctively is to wield the tools of the law to preserve their position. Um, so it's not a completely conscious response and, and in some ways it's organic, but um, but definitely there is a clear direct relationship between the shift in the in the sort of power dynamics in society and um, and and yeah how men are responding. Oh look I'm I like the Sam Dastiari one. Um, that's, a, that's a bit of a personal favourite. That's where he just simply said he never said words that he said over and over again about Sam Dastiari, the magical and enormously creative epithet, Shanghai Sam. Um, never happened, never said it, never, never actually uttered those words um, when uh, a couple of years after Sam Dastiari was forced out of politics, a coalition MP, Liberal MP Grace Liu from... Uh, from Victoria faced, you know, quite similar uh, suggestions that she was a bit closer to the Chinese Communist Party than perhaps might be good for a parliamentarian. Um, uh, Something those words about Shanghai Sam became a little bit inconvenient for, for Scott, and he uh, insisted that he never actually said them. It was a, it's a nice, simple, elegant demonstration of the way in which Scott Morrison, um, you know, would just like to basically put the simple question to you. Who are you going to believe, him or your own lying ears? Yeah, look, there's been so many ways um, that they've exploited secrecy, but um, one of the main ways that we've been looking into is how they've used um, cabinet in confidence rules like no other government. They have pulled it out whenever they can. They've used it to block the release of countless potentially damaging reports. They've used it to stop the release of documents relating to um, robo-debt. Um, they've used it in the Brittany Higgins case. And um, in uh, July, I had a look at how they've been basically setting up phantom cabinet um, committees just so things could be kept secret, th- things could be deemed cabinet in confidence. Um, so there was, for example, in one instance, Scott Morrison was the only member of that cabinet. So, yeah, I'm thinking of setting up my own cabinet in confidence. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the yeah the pandemic's allowed the government to shield itself from scrutiny um, over a number of scandals, and that's kind of because everyone's focused on the pandemic, and they've kind of gotten away with it. An interesting thing for me, there's this old profile of Morrison that was written back in the in the days when he was a shadow minister, um, and it said that you know Morrison didn't have any foreign books on his bookshelf. And he said, I'm not interested in foreign stories. I'm only interested in Australian stories. Yeah, yeah. It's quite symbolic of how he sees the rest of the world. It, it's sort of subordinate to domestic political agenda. When he looks at foreign policy, when you, you look at things he's done, you look at things like the AUKUS deal, where you've got this, this sudden sort of uh, fight with Emmanuel Macron because he handled that so diplomatically poorly. I think on the one hand, you know, not great at the di- diplomacy side of things, but the other hand, that is symptomatic of him not taking it particularly seriously and only thinking of it as kind of secondary to the day-to-day running of the political agenda in Australia. So you, you've seen that with the submarine thing. You've seen that with the China relationship, for example, whereby, you know, obviously China does things that are 
calculated to piss Australia off. China does things that any kind of expansionist uh, wannabe superpower would do. But the way Australia responds to that is, I think, particularly under the Morrison government, fairly tactless. And the reason it is tactless is because, you know, in part, you know, there's a lack of foreign policy talent on that front bench, but also because I think that they're often thinking about things in terms of how it might poll here, you know, whipping up some kind of hysteria and, and beating the drums around China might have some sort of marginal domestic political benefit. Yeah, I I think we thought it was going to be bad, but not quite as bad as it turned out to be. Um, You know, I could say, you know, for all the people who were watching ICAC, there was this collective intake of breath going, what the fuck, really? Gladys? (laughs) Remember that clearly. (laughs) Mark, of all the the people who were going to say fuck, this would be like the first person to say fuck tonight, I wasn't thinking it was maybe you, but I'm glad. (laughs) Well, I've been cancelled, so. (laughs) (laughs) Nothing left to lose. (laughs) Exactly. But it does seem to me that despite despite her resignation and despite a lot of the kind of rhetoric, especially coming from the federal government, about what a, an awful show trial the ICAC process was, it didn't really feel like the whole affair actually did all that much to affect Berejiklian's popularity. I think it's yet another salient reminder of the fact that those of us kind of who are obsessed with politics think you know, about things much more seriously than the uh, things much more deeply that the general populace don't care about. You know, they care about hip pocket things and their families and their homes and things like that. But whether Gladys has had a dodgy boyfriend who's been given a lot of government money, um, you know, maybe they don't care. Even if they know, they don't care. As I'm sure you know, as a, as a regular cracky reader, uh, this is the evening where we often announce the nominees for our uh, Art out of the year and person of the year. I don't want to give anything away, Grace, but you might have made, you might have made it into one of those lists, and I'm I'm not going to tell you which one. Please, please, <laughs> be the art hat. Please. We don't want to give it to another person who wants it. That was a horrible experience. Uh, <laughs> But one question that our readers have been sending in um, in the lead up to tonight's event is, uh, who, who are your picks for, for those two categories? Who are my picks for person yeah. of the year and ass hat of the year? Mm-hmm. And you oh can't pick goodness. yourself for either. Mm-hmm. Sorry? You can't pick yourself for either. <laughs> Damn. Um, who would be my picks for person of the year and ass hat of the year? Oh, my goodness. Um, maybe um, Brittany Higgins. The person of the year. Um, she's an incredible, incredible woman. Um, that goes without saying. Ass hat of the year. I mean, Scott is too obvious a choice. <laughs> we're we're okay with others. <laughs> Maybe the, the like the, there's a um, oh, um, <laughs> Peter Van Onselen, maybe. Oh, whoa, okay. <laughs> now, one thing, I was um, sometimes just, just for entertainment's sake, I scroll through Mark Latham's uh, Twitter, real Mark Latham. This is the real Mark Latham, not the fake Mark Latham, by the way. Anyway, I, scro- I often scroll through real Mark's Twitter because it's just hilarious, and I found one thing that I agree with him on. Um, he called Peter Van Onselen Peter Van Oscillator, and I was like, <laughs> good job. He, 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 he does a turn of phrase in him every now and then later. Yeah, <laughs> he, still, he still pulls out the odds in here. 